Thank you everyone for joining us for our next install, uh, installation of our Goose webinar series. Today we have, again, apologies for butchering your name, Anja van der Hust, um, for giving us a presentation on whole of society conflict gaming. Uh, Anja holds a Master of Science in Educational Technology and received her PhD in Artificial Intelligence and Education from the University of Amsterdam. Currently she leads wargaming efforts at the Netherlands Apply, uh, organization for Applied Scientific Research, TNO. Uh, here she is a lead designer and facilitator of a series of war slash conflict games from tactical level games to strategic level games. So please uh, welcome uh, Andra to the Goose webinar series. Uh, as a point of administration, um, if you have questions, please uh, feel free to insert them into the chat. Uh, please proceed it with the word question so it'll be easier for me as the moderator to track uh, who has a question and who is uh, engaging in our robust dialogue in our chat. Uh, Andrew will be taking all the Q&A at the end of her presentation, so I, which I will curate. So I hand it over to you. Okay, uh, Sebastian, thanks a lot. And so I would have loved to be in spring in Washington uh, but on the other, other hand, I probably wouldn't have been. So it's, it's, it's an honor to be with you uh, from Zoom, uh, from uh, the center of Amsterdam. I live in a very historic quarter. And um, I'm going to take you a little bit into the conflict history of, of where I lived. And from that on, I'd like to go into conflict gaming because it tells a lot of where I come from. So my house is actually from 1873, but it was built on the foundations of an old monastery. And this monastery was built in the late medieval times uh, in around 1390. And it was a, a monastery of a Catholic uh, group, a very sober Catholic group. And it, it stood there not so long because in 1566, angry masses of Protestants roamed the city and burned down everything Catholic really everything Catholic. They went into the churches, they burned down statues, they tore down paintings. And also this, this beautiful monastery was burned down to the ground with the monks inside. And so this was a religious twist that, um, that had been going on for about 20 years. People being, being angry in rage after the Spanish Inquisition and Protestantism came up. So, so these were religious wars in those times. 1566 was also the beginning of the 80 years war. So we, we were in, and that is a while ago, we were for 80 years in a war with the Spanish Spanish emperors, the Spanish king of Spain, and we were in a war of independence. And that war ended in 1648. And that, that date might remind some of you that do international relations of the Peace of Westphalia. So there was this Treaty of Westphalia and all countries were really fed up with this 80 years war which was partly religious, it was partly about power, and it was much about independence of the Dutch uh, provinces. And from that Treaty of Westphalia came our current sovereign order, um, and that still exists. Um, so this is a bit of the history of, of uh, these grounds. These grounds have seen a lot of violence and a lot of conflict. And after that, we fought with the English. Um, there were many wars, and, and our final true war was the Second World War. And well, here the caveat. Obviously, uh, these are my uh, opinions. And let's go to wargaming. Why did I tell you all about all these conflicts in, in the area where, where I live? 
So this is uh, what a classical war game might have looked like about uh, the uh, uh, scene in, in the Second World War. This is Rotterdam. And you don't see red against blue, you see orange against gray, and that is because orange, our, our king is uh, from the family of orange, so we identify with orange. And uh, yeah, you see a number of Dutch uh, military units lying here. And so uh, a, a classical war game would be about these classical military fights. You would have units that might have certain features, they might have a certain firepower, they might be able to move at a certain speed, they, uh, land troops might have some air defense capabilities, and they might have the capacity to see uh, in their surroundings. And the gray units are uh, Nazi troops. And this is May 1940. And so the German troops invaded the Netherlands 10 May of 1940, and there was four days of military fight. And this was the fourth day in Rotterdam, and the Germans were impatient and they, fought, they, they uh, sent out an order to surrender uh, with, on a very short notice. And whether there's a lot of debate went wrong. And if I go back to this beautiful picture, which is actually the city of Rotterdam in, the, in 1895, uh, that was a late medieval city around the beautiful port. And at 14 May 1940, that was left over after 15 minutes of bombardment only. It was a carpet bomb bombardment. And so a firestorm raged. And this was what left what was left of this beautiful historic medieval city. It, um, it luckily many of the people had fled the inner city, so about 850 people died, but 80,000 people were homeless, and it destroyed about 24 churches. It destroyed about 63 churches, and. This was just it, and um, there was a new threat to, to do the same with the city of Utrecht. And so the Netherlands surrendered after four days of not really fighting. My point being is that classical war games model military fight. And the Second World War is known as, as probably the last a war where actually military troops fought military troops, but that wasn't the case for the Netherlands. Uh, we did fight a bit, yes, but uh, the real game changer was this bombardment on a, on a civil center, on a historic town. And that was the end of, of uh, the uh, initial phase of the war for us. In the end, luckily, uh, we were uh, liberated by, by allies. And my, both my mom and dad were liberated by Canadians. I just saw Brian Train coming in. So this is for Brian. Thanks a lot. And uh, we, we have lived in peace since the 1945s, which is, is really a thing to live in, given the history, the violent history of, of this area. So, um, so I don't think that war is military. War is uh, a lot of things, but definitely not only military. Interestingly, um, when I go to connections conferences, there's always the story of why, why the, the Germans had such a leading edge in, in the Second World War. Uh, one of the one of the game changes was their wireless communications and their fast moving tanks. And so they created a blitzkrieg. Well, it was a blitzkrieg, but they just, just bombarded civil cities and, and historic cities. And that was such a, a game changer that we didn't need those, uh, need, we didn't need to be invaded by those fast moving tanks. They did bombard Warsaw, they did bombard uh, the historic city of Coventry. And 
So my point being is that in war, uh, classical, if you try to model war, classical war games are not good enough. They have fixed rules. They have fixed assets. They, you know the features of those assets. And what you do, you play out uh, combat and try in both, both actors or all sides try to optimize and try to be as smart as possible in creating their tactics. To war, uh, the rules are definitely different for different actors. Different actors have different red lines and for the Nazis in the Second World War, it wasn't a red line to bomb away historic cities with its inhabitants. So if there are any rules like uh, rules of law, humanitarian rules, they will be broken. And as we see today, all rules will be, will be exploited. Our rule-based order is being exploited in hybrid war. And that, that is just what is done. And also rules will change over time. For the allies in the Second World War, there was the rule not to, to attack uh, civil centers. However, this is a picture of uh, 1945, the city of Brazen. And that, th that city was named the Florence of the North. It was a beautiful historic Baroque city. And the Allies firebomb Dresden in an American British attack and in February 1945. And it killed about 25,000 people, uh, similar to Rotterdam, a devastating firestorm for, followed. And it destroyed about 40 square meters of the entire city. Um, and there's a lot of post-war debate whether this was justified given uh, the course of the war. And uh, many people think that it's a violation of international law and a crime against humanity. but maybe international law didn't uphold in, at that stage. So rules did change. So in war, also actors will get involved that didn't want to get involved. So uh, the Netherlands was neutral in the first, first World War, but, and we definitely didn't want to be dragged into the Second World War, but we did get dragged into because uh, Germany did need to invade the Netherlands to have uh, a bridge uh, to, to the UK. So we got involved, we got, uh, we, we went on to be party in this conflict. Then um, Germany started to deport uh, the Jews in, in our populations. And that triggered a lot of resistance. About 107,000 Jews were deported, of which only 5,000 actually returned alive and, and not so well, usually. Um, and that triggered quite a bit of resistance, uh, but it also triggered quite a bit of collaboration. There were actually bounty hunters, that, that Dutch people that started hunting for Jews just for money or just to to play nice with the enemy and so interesting actors during war actors may change side they 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 may get involved they may step out it's it's quite dynamic what's going on then um as i i as i state uh war is is much beyond uh, military uh, military fight. As we see today, uh, there is a whole spectrum of societies that's involved in conflict and modern day means our cyber and influencing, old day means our uh, economic uh, warfare and there's buying of, of ports, there is uh, establishing strategic strongholds and there's a lot going on, there's legal warfare. Um, so the ways and means in, in conflict uh, will change. And for ways and means, whatever ways and means possible will be used. And hence war for me, it's a full spectrum of society thing. 
Um, it doesn't involve only governmental organizations, it does involve companies. Uh, if we see all these ransomware attacks, they're usually uh, focusing on companies that are able to pay. Here, um, our, our government organizations try to refuse to, to pay to ransomware attacks, but com companies usually do. And a lot of war is actually mostly below the threshold of war. Um, hence, let's call it conflict. And there is a difficult boundary between war and conflict. So what we do is actually create conflict games that have a fluid border between what is still conflict and what should be seen as war. So we try to, this is actually what we specialize in. Um, we try to build games for the full spectrum of society. Um, in that we try to create games that allow for this dynamic uh, environment. So actors might change, rules might change, ways and means might change. And I forgot one thing I realized, ends may change a lot during me. And there's one thing, and that's why I started with the story of 13, of story of 1566, these furious masses of Protestants roaming the, cities, the, the, the city of Amsterdam and burning down everything that was Catholic. Even this beautiful monastery, they could have used it. They could have hosted their, their folks, but they burned it down, down with all the monks. And, and what you see in conflict is that much of decision-making is less than rational. And here, again, going back to, to the traditional war games, traditional war games usually try, well, the, 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 the players try to be as smart as possible, to, to come up with the most brilliant tactics and strategies. But th that is not necessarily what actors in real conflict actually do. They might just get enraged and, and lash out and do things that you might not consider very rational. So this is also part of what we think about when we try to model games. However, this is hard. So what I'm going to do is, is show you three different games, actually four, um, but I'll get to that, that try to model aspects of this whole of society wargaming. And let's start with uh, an effort that we started 12 years ago. It's called GCAM, a Go For It Comprehensive Approach Model. It was supposed to be a comprehensive approach uh, simulation. And here you see uh, a game session with Rex Bryan at McGill, Canada again. And this game was supposed to uh, simulate an insurgency with a stabilization and a nation building phase. Quite a bit ambitious. So what we started out was doing a mock-up. And, and this is one of my brilliant mistakes I made in, in my game design career. So this was a, a map of Congo. Uh, and we had this narrative of Congo at, um, in the middle of a civil war with a lot of factions fighting, a lot of insurgency. And we were sent UN mission, we were sent there to, uh, to, to bring security, to stabilize the, the, the situation and to do nation building. And here at the left hand side, you see the, the goals, the objectives that we were given. So we had to provide for security, government rule of law, economic de uh, development, healthcare, education, agriculture, and infrastructure. And so in this mock-up, we had two days and we had various teams of military playing NGOs, playing military, playing opposing forces, and playing the local authorities. And these were the different colors. And what happened? Chaos. 
what actually happened was that the military got really fed up with us because we didn't provide them with the information about the roads and the rivers and could these be crossed and were the roads still usable and where were the camps and where was uh, land to be uh, used and, and so it was a lot about where could we put what. Uh, so they, they got really frustrated because we did, just didn't have that information because we had anticipated entirely different, totally different game. What we anticipate was a game about what, why, what are you going to do? Are you going to put your scarce resources into fighting insurgents, into um, repairing the infrastructure so that emergency food supplies could be delivered to um, refugees or, or IDPs. And so we were thinking it's about what's and it's about priorities and it's about timing. And our military thought it's about where to put what. And so, um, and, and there was a lot of things about fighting. So they kept on fighting these insurgents uh, and, and they didn't do any stabilization and, and well, a little bit, but certainly not nation building. Um, so one of our lessons learned was, okay, maps may not be a good idea because maps go the, the game, gameplay quite a bit towards thinking about where to put things logically. That, that's quite logically, but, but it came to us quite a bit later. And also because military are used to plan on maps, they plan for uh, kinetic action. So it skews towards the military. And we were not about military, it was all about Hey, what was it about? It was about stabilization operations. So what did this game turn out to be? It was, um, it, in the end, the world representation just looked like this. We had a country named Zona, and we had a province named Zenawe. Zenawe, yeah, we, we, we found it out. And in Zenawe were all the minority tribes and they had an alternative government and in Zona were majority tribes and there was a front line. And that was basically what was given. Then we had fields of impact. And these were like uh, the security apparatus of the country, uh, the state of displaced person, the basic living conditions in the villages, agriculture, healthcare. So they all parties have been given uh, their objectives, which refer to these fields of impact. We had intermediate parameters that set something about hearts and minds of all the parties involved, and they had to play for it. And there were lots of cards um, with whole of society actions. So it was about agriculture, it was about rebuilding education, it was about rebuilding the economy. And interesting, there was also a lot of unexpected. For instance, here supply, supply seeds and fertilizer. So you might think that this would help build your agriculture. Well, it didn't because um, this fertilizer was put on an already rich soil, which actually spoiled the crops. And fertilizer was also uh, found in IEDs that can lovely be built from fertilizer and, and fuel, uh, just uh, benzene, diesel fuel. And so there was a quite an unexpected effect of having more IDs on, on road sites, uh, which, which brought people down quite a bit. And um, so this was the first game we actually created um, to try to do whole of society. And it was simulation based, so digital simulation based. Um, that was the hard part of it. How to model, properly model, such a comp complex whole of society conflict? Well, 
What were the lessons learned? So first of all, uh, if you, you try to have a full spectrum of society conflict, try fields of impact rather than maps and let these fields of impact be all these fields that you think are relevant in this whole of society conflict. Uh, the dynamics. So we had different means in different phases. So there was a, a phase where the insurgency should have been fought and their military would do military things. But then you had a stabilization phase where um, you had a provincial reconstruction team doing things like making sure that refugees were having shelter and clean water sanitation. And NGOs would, would be allowed, be enabled to, to work. And at the end, you would have a, a transfer phase where actually military should not build roads, should not build shelter, uh, and they would be punished for that in the simulation because that should be left to the local population. So different means in different phases and different rules in different phases, and it was a lot of unexpected. Um, that went well, but a lot of things did not go well. And um, first of all, and that's the, the big bummer here, simulation modeling for whole of society may not be such a good idea. I came from a department that was totally into simulation because uh, we used to do kinetic simulation. We came from operational analysis where a lot of data was gathered on features of military assets. So you had these models of attrition where you could kind of calculate if we have 30 blue tanks uh, with this armor and this ammunition shooting at 40 red tanks with this armor and this ammunition and you shoot for like three hours, you might have this damage to uh, both sides. Um, so from this tradition, we try to build simulations. And actually, I was young and ambitious, and I had learned to, to, to program Prolog, and I learned a bit about AI and ontologies, so I set myself to it, and I, I actually spent two years on, on getting it right, and well, <laughs> um, well, I, I, I actually, so Every time we played it, and, and I think I've hosted it about 42 times, which is a magic number, but by the way, and it, it never was good. It, it was sufficient for educational purposes, and it was sufficient for a good suspension of disbelief, but there were so many interactions that every now and then, effects popped up that were not credible. And obviously I was very practical in, in come up with and coming up with a narrative that made it, made it totally logical. But in the end, that is not good enough. And I've had many questions on, could we use this model for analysis? And my answer was, please don't. Because um, the effect, we don't have this, this operational analysis data on the effects of what is the effect of, of actually trying to rebuild education. Like in, in Afghanistan, we tried to build schools for girls. Well, they're all, all destroyed now. And Taliban is back and they, what they do is destroy the, girls, the schools for girls because girls can't go to school, obviously. Right. Um, so, and, and we dug uh, pits for, for drinking water and it tended to, it turned out to be in the wrong territory. So the, the fight emerged between clans and, and so it, it exacerbated the conflict rather than, than made it better. So you don't have the data and besides there are many difficult interactions. Also in this game, the behavior was mostly rational and, and I hate that. So people were trying to be smart and they were not trying to be emotional and get into rages and, and do stupid things and destroy and, and burn down, which is what people in conflict do. And, but sometimes I got a little bit of irrationality, but not sufficient. So, 
this didn't work for analysis. It did work uh, relatively well for education, to be honest. Uh, but we needed stuff for analysis because we didn't build for education, basically. And we have to talk about forecast accuracy. Uh, I'm going into the brilliancy of role play. Um, I, I stole these slides from Tom Mowitz, actually, with his permission. Um, uh, these are a number of slides on forecast uh, research by uh, Keston Green. Uh, most of the research is, is from around 2004. Kirsten and Green uh, does, does research into what methods provide the best forecast accuracy. And he compared unaided judgment, like experts providing their judgment on the outcomes of conflict. Um, game theory, game theorists uh, calculating the outcomes of a conflict or role play, role playing a conflict to find out, to see what, what emerges. And Keston Green uh, took a number of actual conflicts, anonymized them, so he obscured them, and he defined a number of possible outcomes. So for instance, for this one, he defined like six possible answers. And so the chance level of just having it right would be 70%. And that varied, like uh, this, this conflict had four possible answers, like 20, 25%. These had to be like credible, uh, credible outcomes. So th this was the chance level. And then uh, um, he did have experts predicting, forecasting the outcomes of conflict. And it varied a lot. Uh, here it was pretty good on a nurse's dispute, but here in the beginning it was quite bad. It was quite bad. And the overall was uh, only a little above uh, chance level. Then there were the game theory, uh, theory people. And these conflicts have been, have been selected beforehand by them. Uh, in the sense that they could actually do something with it. Not all conflicts can be uh, calculated using game theory. In this case, it could. But then again, game theory just barely above the level of chance. Then it gets exciting, doesn't it? What does role play do? Wow, double the level of chance. And this is interesting. This is interesting. Why, why is that? So it's a lot better. So Kirsten Green had his students in, in, and they were in the field play out these conflicts and he got a very good outcome. Obviously a little bit above 60% is not 100%, so it's not entirely accurate, but it's a lot better than unaided judgment. So having, uh, and, and these role play, it was adversarial. So there was the adversary, adversaries playing against the people that wanted something. And we think indeed that the proper opposition generates a good action reaction feedback loop that actually produces insight uh, vastly more powerful and accurate than a single opinion, which might be well informed. And, and the people that were in the groups of Casting Green were well informed. So that's interesting. So role play. So role play is the thing then. What well, at least let's let's try that venue. Um, obviously, you resort to matrix gaming, and matrix gaming for most of you will be known. But I'll I'll go quickly through it. Uh, it's it's a form of role play. You might have a number of actors. Uh, it's not only red against blue, but you can have multiple actors, which give nice interactions. Um, uh, there are no limits on domain, so you don't have a, a set of military entities. Uh, the players can do whatever they like, and um, uh, they have a full freedom of what to do. There's no fixed fixed assets. Um, they can do different things in different phases. So matrix game sounds really good. And this is uh, an example of Tim Price, uh, Ch uh, Slavia, 
and, and here you see a lot of the icons being used, but players can also create their own icons. And this is the non-military part. And he, with the smileys, you, you sort of indicate the opinions of the population so that you model the hearts and minds of the population. It's, we, we have done a lot of matrix games and I love them. It's, it's because of the freedom of the whole society aspects. It's, it's because of the, uh, the role play aspects. But you, so you use human experience and intellect rather than stimulation. Um, I still don't like the maps in, in metrics games because they still tend to skew you towards the kinetics of conflict. And I would say try fields of impact which is actually what we do. And this is what our whole of society uh, matrix games look like at this moment in time. So for those with a bit of military background, here we have uh, icons for actions, which are in the DIMO framework, DIMO or DIMFIL, diplomatic information, uh, the military is below here, economy, legal, and worse a bit of social which falls out of the dimo. Um, there are empty icons to have to allow players for full freedom. Then here we have the fields of impact and in the military terminology it's PEMISI, you know, political, military, economic, social, information and infrastructure. And what people do is they play out uh, their actions in the fields of impact. Like, for instance, you have a field of impact infrastructure, and here someone is playing a cyber action, which is in the information domain, to hack into the infrastructure. And I have the feeling that this works a lot better than having just a map which is, is basically a bit too close to the old classical war games. So just, just use your fields of impact and let people uh, indicate what kind of effect they do expect. Well, here they play it out, red against blue, but it might be multiple actors. Here we have a number of, of events that will screw up your beautiful plans and, and insert the unexpected. Um, we think this works better for whole of society conflict than the classical uh, matrix games. However, good role play is extremely hard. That's one of our lessons learned. And we still lack the irrationality, the burning down of historic cities, the burning down of, of, of religious uh, symbols the lashing out in anger, the freezing in terror. So we wanted to improve this. And not because we like all this anger, not because we like all this violence, but if you properly want to model conflict, then you have to be willing to get into it and try to model it right. So that's what we were going to try. So good role play. Um, for, for being a good role player, you have to get into personal history, the context, the traumas of the people, the traumas of the person. You have to get into the culture, the non-negotiable beliefs, which includes religious beliefs that are non-negotiable. You have to get into personalities of, of, of leadership, but also of the people in the street. And you have to think about the trigger events that, that and what emotions they cause. So we try to build a game and we actually spend about three to four years on this one. It's called the Cultural Competence Quest. It's built together with Duke University, my dear friends, friends Shai Ginsberg, Leo Ching and Amy Kwan. And we were trying to model human decision-making in conflict. And we were trying to make our students experience really experience the polarization that is in conflict. And I forgot my colleague from TNO, Rudy Bonacon. To understand what we had to model, we went into research on violence. 
And we were lucky because two of our TNR colleagues actually had done 15 years of research into violence. Uh, well, you can't read this, but this is one of the, 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 the maps of what are the factors in, in violence. But you see, for instance, demographics, uh, age and gender, male and men are more uh, prone to violence, um, young fellers are definitely more prone to violence. Uh, so th these are like temperament, but three factors really, really, four factors actually, were the things that we were going to use in our games. And that was emotions, non-negotiable beliefs being either cultural or religious, and personality, and we were going to have trigger events. Why all this? Let's start with emotions. Um, so look at this. This is the wheel of emotion. This, this wheel is supposed to depict a number of, of primary emotions, anger, joy, fear, sadness, disgust. It's from Robert Plutchik. And in, in within uh, the leaves of this, this wheel, you see levels of intensity. So fear may, may have low level apprehension and very high level indicated by terror. Why are we showing this? So Paul Ekman, who is also an emotional uh, a researcher into emotions, has done a lot of work on the, the logical actions, the, the, the instinctive actions that are related to emotions. So what actions are logically related to terror? And here it says freeze, scream, yell, withdraw, but this is the classical freeze, fight and flight reactions. This is what people do. And what they do actually depends on many factors including their personal temperament. But this is one of the reasons why people in soldiers in the battlefield, when they're really terrified, might not be able to shoot. They might freeze. They might flight. They might not fight. Uh, that depends and, and it's different. Then if we go to anger, because we're talking about violence, so Paul Ekman showed what you might do in case of annoyance. And with annoyance, you can still act rationally. So uh, you can suppress any, any, any respond to that emotion. You can be passive aggressive or simmer a brute, but you can still act rationally and logically. However, if, if you get into a rage, then is a rage or fury, then it's likely that you want to scream or yell, that you want to use physical force, that you want to insult or quarrel. And it might look very familiar to anyone here. The point is that if, if someone angers you so badly, if you get into a rage, you just want to do only one thing and that is lash out. That is just lash out and hurt the one who is, that is causing all that rage. And forget about acting rational. There's no way that you're going to act rational. What does determine whether you get into a rage? Well, there's the first part, personality. Some people are, are really stable and, and they might be annoyed, but some people have a very bad temper and with the same, same events, they might, might get into a rage. There are personality types that, that go to, into a rage a couple of uh, times per day, and, and it just comes and it goes. And it's part of personality. Then uh, trigger events. So trigger events might be a thing, but trigger events are being colored by non-negotiable beliefs. So, for instance, if someone insults your, your, your faith, your religion, you might perceive a strong uh, oppression or humiliation, and that might push you into a rage. 
And so there's an interaction between personality trigger events, non-negotiable beliefs, and, and the, the perception of, of what it all is into emotions. And emotions may lead to certain actions that, that can't be stopped. So this is one of the, the pathways to violence. And actually, from, from reading a lot about this, this humiliation is one of the, the big, big triggers of rage. It's, it's, it's a very bad one. Oppression, deprivation, but humiliation is, is really bad. So what does this reflect in, in everyday life? And I took an example that is a bit more uh, recent. So 2014, um, reflecting elements still from the Second World War, there was in, in, in this place in Estonia, there was a statue of uh, a Russian soldier still standing in Estonia after, uh, after Estonia became independent. And for Estonians, this was really a hated symbol of Soviet occupation. They, they, they have been in a war, they have been occupied forever, and, and they have been occupied by the Soviet Union for four ages, and they have been oppressed. So they wanted this bronze soldier to be removed, and then they actually they did that. But the non-negotiable belief of Russia was that this hero was a symbol for the liberation of, of Estonia from the Nazis in World War II and all the, the sacrifices the Russians made to actually liberate uh, part of Europe from, well, I don't know when it, whether Estonia was liberated, but, but a large part of Europe was liberated by the Russians and they lost many, many, many people. It prompted a rage and as a result, there was three weeks of massive cyber attacks, massive cyber attack on financial, political and government systems in Estonia. And this is what modern day conflicts might look like. And it's again about these non-negotiable beliefs that are being violated. So if you're experiencing conflict, you have to model and, and experience the impact and interaction of non-negotiable beliefs, personality and emotions. So that's what we did. So Cultural Competence Quest modeled two cases, the Israel-Palestine conflict from the 1900s and the comfort woman issue in uh, between Japan and South Korea. And uh, the comfort women system was the system of forced prostitution uh, in the Second World War by Japan that uh, employed a lot of Korean, South Korean women. Um, there, it's still contentious and it still causes a lot of uh, trouble. So what we did, we, we did a lot of historic analysis of those two conflicts. And we saw different faces. And roughly, we, we outlined three faces attention building phase, like the Israel-Palestine conflict we modeled from the 1900s, while Jews in Palestine still relatively harmoniously lived together. They lived amongst each other, they, they were neighbors, and it wasn't all fine, but it, it was relatively peaceful. And then World War I, there was the so-called Balfour Declaration in 1917 that promised the Jews a home in, his, in, in, in Palestine. And tension rose and then there was the Hebron massacre that killed about 70 Jews, uh, 70 Jews being killed by Palestine, a lot of people injured. And from that, it was a lot of, a lot of conflict and there have been many wars. And usually there is a post-conflict phase uh, that could be either after building a war or, um, or just one party just uh, winning the war and, and subduing the other part. But there's a lot of residual, residual tension and conflict may rise again. We had actions in the different phases. So we had 
different action for the relatively harmonious phase, for the full conflict phase, and for the post-conflict phase. So it wasn't one set of actions. We had fields of impact, and we made the same mistake again. We tried to build simulations. Mm, yeah, a lot of work put in there, not so good. But if finally we did uh, uh, the fields of impact, we, we established them manually by uh, adjudicators. And so our four parties in the Jew Palestine one was the Palestine, Palestine elite, the socialist, the Jewish elite, and the Jewish socialist. And interesting, like in the harmonious phase, they might work together, Palestine socialists and the Jewish socialists. Like in the 1900s, socialism was a big thing. And we had parameters for tension and violence. So how did the game start? So the game started with our players building their personalities. They, they would indicate their personality, their non-negotiable beliefs and their current emotions. And it looked like this. And later on, we had some more specific non-negotiable beliefs and the initial setting of emotions. Then we started playing out, say, the first phase of this conflict. And they had action cards. And they could play it out in private or community level or public level. And that would cost again. They had resources and public level would cost a lot, private not so much. And they had action cards like this. And look at this, this was a positive card. So they could establish inter-ethnic inter groups like groups of socialist Palestine, socialist Jew, socialists working together against the elite. Very interesting. Then there were trigger events. So for instance, this massacre in Hebrew. And from that, we went into the second phase. And so players played out new actions. They updated their personality to blow. So the emotions might get more towards anger and despair. And, and we played out uh, uh, a number of rounds in the high conflict phase. And interestingly, they would do things like take land rights in the conflict phase. And this says that it's a negative action. But what we noticed was that they didn't do things like violate uh, religious symbols. They didn't do really irrational things. So in, in uh, a next version of this game, we gave them uh, positive and negative resources. And the more their emotions became negative, the more negative and the less positive resources they got. And then they could, at a certain moment, they could only do negative actions. And then they could choose negative actions like violate religious practices of the other group. And they did. They had a full set of actions to take but with all these negative emotions, they could actually do things like violate religious practices, and they did. So lessons learned. We, we did a lot of testing, and the mechanics did work, and the concept could be reused over conflicts. And then it went into class, uh, so two times three weeks at Duke University. Um, in the Department of Middle, Middle East and uh, East Asian Studies. And yes, it was sufficient historically accurate. So the irrationality was there and there was an inst intense experience of conflict. Yes, there was intense emotions, irrationality. Although, of, co of course, the students said, we're not actually this emotional, but we do feel these emotions. We actually do feel these emotions. We, we have shown their own our, our personality display we created narratives based on these emotions and we do feel them and in the reflection after these two times three weeks of gaming what they said was that they much better understood why in this case Jews in Palestine did what they do and why these conflicts are so irreconcilable 
why it's so hard to get back to, to the basics, to, to what it was in 1900 and go back uh, living harmoniously. With all these things happening and all these traumas emerging from, from the irrational violent acts that, that weren't necessary, but they were done and, and acted out of, out of rage and, and fury, uh, it is hard to reconcile. So to wrap up, um, I'm quite quick, which is good. Uh, so conflict is messy. Conflict is whole of society. The ways change, the means change. And yeah, the ends must change, the rules, the, the red lines will change. And actors change, actors get involved, actors change from neutral to, to party. Uh, actors do behave irrational, yet there is a logic to it. There is a logic to it. We are, we have a certain psychological upmake, uh, which makes us lash out when we get into rages. And so we might call it irrational, but there is a psychological logical uh, logic to it. Um, so to, to wrap up this talk, uh, the lessons learned. So <laughs> beware of maps. So whole of society conflicts is not about where to where to put your things. Um, uh, it is about what to do, how to prioritize, where to put your scarce resources on, uh, not where to put stuff. Uh, beware of simulations. We don't have the data. We don't understand the interactions. And the situation changes a lot because the assets change, the features of the assets change. And as soon as you have a bit of a simulation, the whole world changes again. And, and you'll probably work with the old uh, data, the old simulation, because it has been so much work to create this beautiful simulation. So maybe try not to, or try, uh, but just to learn more about the interactions when you do have data. Also beware of rationality. So wargaming uh, traditionally is about who is the smartest and who can come up with the smartest tactics. Real conflict is not about that. So at, at the military level, uh, if you work on tactics, yeah, it might be about rationality, but not here in the whole of conflict, of whole of society sphere. Uh, you have to can uh, you have to engage the irrational part of, of human behavior, otherwise your forecast accuracy will be very limited. And that made me think why uh, Kesson Green's uh, role plays did so much better than the, the expert, the, the unaided judgment expert. And, I think in the role play, there was a level of irrationality. There was a level of emotions involved. There was a level of, let's think about those personalities involved and, and what their temperament would be and how they would respond to violations of their non-negotiable beliefs. So let me end with this. Uh, beware of map, beware of simulations, and beware of rationality. So. Um, Forget classical wargaming, uh, it, it must be different. And we're nowhere to the ultimate solutions of it, but it's very interesting research and uh, we wish to continue for quite a bit on it. So that was it and I'll stop sharing. That's perfect, thank you. So I have a couple of questions lined up for you. Right. The first question is, um, have the findings of these games been published somewhere? If so, uh, can you share the links? Yeah, so uh, partly, partly they have. So the, the cultural contents quest, yes, um, it has been publicized. The GCAM has been publicized. Um, the, the Fields of Impact one hasn't. I'll, I'll post the links later on. I'll have to search for it. but. Yes, all person. Absolutely. So we'll Goose will pass those along um, in the future. Yeah. Yes. So there's a slight echo coming from you. Um, so apologies from my part. 
how do you balance being uh, comprehensive in the whole of society gaming that you sort of walked us through and managing the scope and problem uh, set that you're examining in a singular game? Yeah. Yeah, true, true. Um, so a singular game with a limited goal, like, uh, so, so for instance, the game where you would have like, 30 tanks on some, some air assets and you would get into a multi-domain no uh, air lands uh, battle there you would not uh, bother with all this thing like uh, you would have a map and you might have a simulation and and it would be rational indeed but um that that's not what we were after and for that for 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 that limited domain uh with a limited set of assets and a fixed set of rules yeah you you would still do classical wargaming so i think that's always an interesting element to discuss because often the traditional classical gaming in the red versus blue maps on the table, hexes and counters is always sort of criticized because it treats you know, countries and places like emptied vacuums devoid of people yeah. and your know, societies, right? So you can just roll a brigade into a random town because it, it, you can be there, but uh, reality is not so simple, I think. But I think it does require a certain level of balance and understanding the purpose of your game for whoever you're building it for. Um, so another question is, can you say more about your work in terms of uh, how do you create these games and for what, uh, for who and why people play these types of games? Yeah, so part of my work is purely academic. Uh, so I work with, with Duke uh, on, on really understanding the essence of conflict a bit better. And, and, and we wanted to work on, on a different pedagogy so that students wouldn't have to just read all these essays, but actually play it out and, and take decisions and, and get engaged. Um, and part of this is uh, more applied to modern day conflict. Um, so that, that's within my research or organization. And what we do is, is basically we build games for education, for, for people in national security to better understand aspects in, in, in like in hybrid warfare. And we do build uh, games for analysis to, to uh, generate courses of actions and to test them out in, in, in an adversarial environment. So keeping with the broad questions first is, can you discuss some of the, the intellectual models and uh, assumptions baked into some of your comprehensive whole society gaming and how you balance what models to include and what, uh, what sources to rely on? Yeah, okay. So the, the comprehensive approach model, um, that was a, a kind of a mixture of NATO doctrine on stabilization operations combined with a comprehensive approach model. So uh, built by the Civic Center of Excellence, the NATO Civic Center of Excellence, we, we actually worked with uh, a center of excellence that uh, had a comprehensive approach tiger team and they collected lessons uh, identified from Afghanistan and Iraq in, in, the, in the days. And they try to sort of organize and model those. So all the unexpected effects actually came from those collections. Um, and, and talking about doctrine, so because we didn't have data, actually our simulation model implemented the doctrine. So if the doctrine said to do something like this is right, then the model would implement that. And if you did you did A and the doctrine said that it was right, then it was actually right. Except for that, there was unexpected uh, effects from the Tiger team. So moving on to some of this stuff is, is, what are some of the next steps for your research using this type of full society gaming? Wow, yeah, yeah. That's really a good question. I myself are really 
intrigued by by uh, why people resort to violence, but uh, uh, moreover to, to why why we are so polarized. So probably the next step would be is to to create a game about polarization and about religious polarization, about political polarization, and to to kind of reenact uh, from a stage where people just happily live together and have no idea about political differences uh, into the current state of affairs where everything is so polarized. And, and you might even try different political systems like uh, the difference between like US and, and the Netherlands is that we have a multi-party system. And interestingly, people uh, hop a lot between parties. Like uh, we have three uh, socialist parties, left-wing parties. We have a number of right-wing parties from extremists. We have a number of very moderate, uh, sometimes Christian parties. And every election, people just look at the map with this year, we just had election 23 parties, I think even more. And you really have to do like, like quizzes to find out which which party matches your uh, your preferences best. But what what works is it, it's far less polarized. Interesting. So so it might be so try different political systems and see how polarization ends up. I think the issue of polarization in society is a fascinating one. Um, and I think you would have definitely lots of interest. Uh, definitely, I would be interested in seeing that kind of gaming. Uh, so the next question is, these games don't play themselves. Professional games and simulations from the simplest matrix game up uh, depend on good facilitators or even a team of facilitators. Should a yeah. facilitator always be counted on by players to always be rational? Oh, good question. Good question. Oh, that's a hard one to answer. So for the historical uh, games that we did with Duke, uh, we had uh, both for the Israel-Palestine uh, game, we had Shai Ginsberg, who is an absolute expert on, on, on the topic. And so he judged according to historical accuracy. And for the, the comfort women case, we had Liu Ching and Amy Huan, who actually taught for years about that topic. So, so they judged, they, they were adjudicating according to historical accuracy. For many other matrix games, I noticed that when I facilitate and, and adjudicate, uh, you're, it, it's hard to do a proper adjudication when you don't have sufficient background. So, uh, I, I try to read and read and read forever into the background of the conflicts and, and, and into the actors uh, to be able to adjudicate. And then I try to adjudicate uh, the way actors act according to what I think would be a sound given what I know about the conflict. But it, yeah, it, it's, it, it creates bias because it's your own personal opinion. Uh, but within matrix games, of course, the, you judge on the, on the basis of the arguments of the players. So, uh, notwithstanding my own personal opinion on, on whether uh, an action is sound, when their arguments are really strong, then they get it. And, and of course, you roll the dice. So, uh, there's an aspect of, of chance in it. So we'll uh, proceed on to some of the questions that relate directly to some of the games you mentioned. It says, how did you distill the area of operation down to sites of civil unrest and persistent resource conflict across the domains in terms of land, air, sea, and human? Holy, holy, holy. But so like multi-domain, land, air, sea, but also space and cyber, uh, that, that again is, is the military part of it. And um, here in, in those games, we explicitly include population. We explicitly include uh, the private sector, uh, non-governmental sectors, uh, as they are actors as well. So I find it hard to, to, 
to answer properly that question because it, it, it gets us back to the, the military again. A military is just only a small part of, of what happens in, in, in whole society conflict. I, I hope, no, it doesn't answer the question properly, but you see I'm struggling. Yeah, no worries. Uh, so I think the real essence of that question is how do you decide uh, what areas of importance within your know, society is quite big and so are conflicts, especially when you're taking a wide lens view. So how do you decide which parts are important? Yeah. Is that sponsor driven? Is that research driven? Um, all, right. Uh, all right, all right, all right, yes. Um, yeah, partly it's, it's sponsor driven. It's, it's driven by the nature of the conflict. Like recently we, we modeled uh, Ukraine, the, the conflict in Ukraine. And um, military wise, I just had two, two elements that was irregular and regular forces. Uh, when I would do uh, a future force uh, game, I would have all kinds of capabilities for like for military uh, 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 capabilities, and that would be a large set. But that truly depends on the purpose of the game. I think so going along with that theme is uh, in reference to some of the games, were the options of covert or irregular warfare actions available to act? actors such as caching, smuggling, psychological oh, warfare yes. and other oh, options? Yes. Uh, obviously, yes. And that is indeed uh, what is the essence of... So there's, in, in, in true conflict, obviously, before you enter the, the, the true stages of war where military units get involved, there, there's so much going on. It's It's criminal organizations that, that act as proxies that might be used as uh, boots on the ground. There might be uh, um, irregular forces, just people that have a gr hold a grudge against uh, the majority. It might be infight between factions, between religious groups. Uh, yeah, so it's the essence to actually have the, all those irregular aspects in your conflict games. Otherwise, it would totally defy the purpose. So given the vast array of irregular things you can do from sabotage to human intelligence, uh, what are some of, how do you narrow some of those options down? Does that depend on game to game or is there a particular pool of things that you guys go to normally? Yeah, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm returning the question, why would you want to narrow it down? No, that's a good question. Maybe you don't narrow it down at all. <laughs> the point is that uh, we are searching for games that can be used for analysis. And if we sort of limit the options people have, and, and given that they have done their research on the background of the actors, the, the ways and, and means of the actors, and that they properly understand uh, the dynamics of the conflict and um, and they have thought about their own emotions, the, the, the nature of their leadership, and uh, then I would not want to limit the options that they can employ, because then you would introduce a bias into your analysis that you don't want. So on that note, uh, can you discuss from, from some of the games you discussed some examples of highly effective irrational actions? You, you mentioned the role of rationality and irrationality in your games. Yeah, yeah, okay. So the comprehensive approach game that, that was 12 years ago, uh, what we noticed with groups that played really well uh, as insurgents was that initially they played very nice. And I must explain that we had intermediate parameters for hearts and minds. And initially the parameters for hearts and minds for the insurgents were really high because they were located in the province of Zenawe, where all the minority tribes were. And they were the actual the leadership of 
um, and, and the military units, the, the paramilitary units of those minority troops. So what they did was actually play very nice in the beginning and sort of um, collect resources, not, not, not spend so much, just do a bit nice, create schools for uh, religious schools for boys only, which was uh, enjoyed by, by the minor minority tribes. And they had their own health care and they didn't, they weren't so violent, but they, they were collecting resources all the time. And when everyone fell asleep, well, okay, these, these guys are just being nice. Then they made a total rollover and, and just made a, uh, a full attack and and usually when they did that they would win and um, so um there was a lot of uh scheming here with using the local population uh, uh so that they would turn against your enemy and and would help you a lot because th that was part of this game if your hearts and minds parameters would get really low then your effectivity would get low. So they made sure that the effectivity of the other, other parties, especially the, the, the UN forces would get low and the population actually hated them. And then they made a total rollover. So UN went home uh, when, when insurgents played very well. And uh, they demoralized a lot. So they took uh, UN people hostage, they killed them and, and made sure that it got into the press, in the, into the media, uh, uh, in, in the home countries of those UN people. And it was a lot of demoralizing. So it's, it's nasty what they did. And, and that's one of the strategies that actually worked very well. I hope I'm not giving anyone uh, a, a good idea here. <laughs> uh, so um, on that note, um, have you considered, have you used integrating conciliatory or mediating actors within a given scenario? And what do you think uh, the introduction of these kind of actors would have on gameplay and game dynamics? Intermediary actors. Um, could, could you explain that a little bit more? So I think the question, and correct me if I'm wrong for whoever uh, put this question is, the way I'm reading it is, uh, for instance, uh, actors who are in charge of serving as bridges between two adversarial sides, right? So instead of just having red and blue, having okay. characters or, or uh, factions that are, yeah. you know I mean, like in real life, bridging the gap between those two factions. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah. Um, like in... Uh, the comprehensive approach game, we had non-governmental organizations that try to bridge between all parties. Um, and the point was a bit that, like in the Israel-Palestine conflict, you might have had, like, it, it, it back then, in, in, in the 80s, you might have, for instance, had the Americans or the Swedes, or the, sorry, the Norton or um, uh, people from Europe trying to negotiate a peace. And um, no, we, we, we did not insert them. And that is just practical because we we didn't get to that stage of the conflict but well, it might have been very interesting because somewhere you might want to play out the the phases where a conflict really can die down like the the conflict in the north irish conflict in the end it 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 got a little bit more peaceful although it's it's flaring up again which is so bad um but also interestingly, like I talked a lot about Second World War, and uh, we're actually at the moment we're best buddies with the Germans, and so a lot of things happened that were actually very good. So that might have been one of my next games as well is to try to model uh, how conflicts might die down in, in a proper way and how reconciliation actually would work, given the irrationality and the lingering anger and rage that, that will still be there.
Yeah, I think that's a fascinating, that's a fascinating facet. facet. Yeah. So the next question, so the next is, question is, is, actions are actions important are in affecting the whole of society, society conflict. conflict. But so is the transmission, so is the transmission of, ideas. of ideas. So how so do you how duplicate the communication, communication of ideas, of ideas within, within society? Within society and ideas like in uh, so like in influencing the population is that was meant or i think it's a little bit of, uh, of a uh, broad, broad question, question in terms of not only the population, population but, also but also within factions, factions themselves, themselves and where, where disinformation, disinformation plays uh, a role mm -hmm. yeah. but, but also, also in the sense of what each, each faction, faction thinks, thinks is important to themselves, themselves. yeah Okay, okay. Um, yeah, so influencing a, a plays a role and it always did. Like um, I started out in, in my little uh, spare bathroom here, uh, sitting on the foundations of, of the monastery. And why did people get so angry? Well, that had to do with, with uh, centuries of of repression of uh, of different ideas and and centuries of influencing and uh, centuries of of burning people uh, on burn piles. Uh, the, the Spanish Inquisition was raging, and so that was a form of influence, violent influencing. And nowadays we see uh, a lot of influencing, certainly in this pandemic. There's a lot of conspiracies and uh, and disinformation. Obviously, that has to be part of uh, of our whole of society games. So in the in the game, so in the what, what I call campaign games. So the the matrix games that would not have maps but would have these fields of impact. Uh, in the information field, yeah, there's a lot going on. Obviously, populations are being uh, influenced, and it, it's very powerful. Here, here in, in Western Europe, a lot of 5G uh, mobile phone uh, masks were, were set to fire because of a conspiracy that Corona originated from 5G. Yes, really. And it wasn't one ma uh, mask, it was a lot of them. So, um, and, and it's very destabilizing. Not those burning of masks, obviously, but uh, all the, the skepticism about vaccines and, and all that. So it has to be part of it, absolutely. So it seems like we've got all the questions. All question. One of the things One we like to end like these conversations, conversations with, with is if you, if had, you had limited, limited funding, funding, no, no institutional, institutional obstacle, obstacle, what is a game, is that, a you game like that you would like to design? Like to design and, uh, I'm in doubt between my reconciliation game and the polarization game, but I have a tendency towards um, evil <laughs> and I go for the polarization game. I think it, it, it should be so interesting to try out all these different interventions, try out all these different political systems and, and show and, and, and try to game how polarization will will end up and how it affects society. So I, I go for the polarization game. Well, Andre, I would like to thank you for spending your uh, evening slash afternoon with us here on, uh, on Goose. And I really hope and look forward to one day hearing about your polarization and reconciliation game. It sounds like an absolute awesome series of games. I'll keep my eye out for it. Uh, but thank you, everyone, for having such a great uh, discussion on, on uh, you know, I mean, Tuesday afternoon. And hopefully you guys will come back for our next week's uh, events as well. And please thank, uh, please thank Andrea in the chat for her wonderful expertise and her generosity with spending her, her afternoon slash evening with us. Uh, for those who are interested, this will be posted to YouTube later today, uh, along with the presentation. Uh, so have a good day. And thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thanks all. Um... For me, it's, uh, well, cheers from Amsterdam, and for me, it's time for dinner. So thanks again. Uh